welcome to the first public lecture to be hosted by RES in collaboration with the Asian Civilization Museum, the very first public lecture of this year. And Happy New Year. Uh, I am Chua Bin Hoa, uh, currently a member of the Asia Research Institute. Um, Professor Lili Kong, who's the director of the Asia Research Institute, is overseas. The deputy director, uh, Bob Roy Ko, is on sabbatical. <laughs> so uh, the duty falls on me to say something about Ali uh, before this evening's lecture by Professor Wang Dan. Um, Ali was set up in the year 2000 with the explicit intention of developing a center of excellence of research at the NUS um, to focus specifically on things Asia. Um, it is directly funded by the university and therefore uh, we have so far been fortunate enough uh, not to have to depend on outside funding, although most of the big research projects are increasingly externally funded. But we bring scholars from all over the world, which I mean globally, to come to RE and to the NUS for a period of between three months at the shortest end to a possibility of four years. And um, we also took, we also uh, hold month, weekly, RE is an extremely event intensive place because with the exception of those who have cross appointment with the university, with a particular faculty of arts and social science, all RE research fellows do not teach. So RE research fellows, sole responsibility is to do research, <coughs> write, and have conferences and go to seminars. So we are an extremely intensive, uh, very extremely event intensive place. Every Tuesday afternoon there is a seminar and almost every month there is a workshop, an international workshop or an international conference. Sometimes two, sometimes three. So in one year, Ari organizes at least 12 workshops and conferences. All of these workshops and conferences are, will eventually be published either in book form uh, or in monographs in special issues of journals. So we are also highly, uh, we are also a very sort of publishing result oriented place. Of course, we would like to do everything Asian, but we obviously could not, could not possibly do everything Asian. So there are six specific fo focus uh, which are regards and where the research fellows cluster around. There are six research clusters. Um, let, me think, let me see if I can remember all of them. Changing family, which is a big issue, as all of you know, in Asia, particularly declining family, uh, but, uh, declining family formation and birth rates, migration, with, without which Singapore population will be less by a quarter, um, religion, which of course is a very important social uh, cultural component and political component of Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is seriously divided into major religious regions. Um, <coughs> cultural studies, of which I am the cluster leader, are uh, probably the least heavy of all the clusters because we do a lot of work on television, movies, and pop music. <laughs> So, uh, and now and there is a cluster that is just getting off the ground in science, technology, and society. And finally, 
that is the, city, uh, uh, the cluster concentrated on looking at cities in Asia. And just in case those six areas, uh, just in case someone really interesting come along and doesn't fit into those six areas, we will take them in under something called open cluster. So, we, so there is enough flexibility for us to accommodate every person that we think worth having to come to Ari. And so that, you know, um, in addition to all those activities that we do within, the, within Ari itself, just in case you do not know where it is, it's actually located in the Bukit Timah campus of NUS, in the uh, tower block. Most of the activities, of course, are carried out within the premises of Ari, uh, sometimes at the Cambridge campus. But we do have part, we do have as outreach program two fairly important programs. One is the occasional public lecture series like tonight. And the other is a annual series of seminars which we call Asia Trends, which will be conducted in April and May of this year in collaboration with the National Library Board. Each of the research cluster will, act, will provide one seminar in the evenings with an invited speaker from overseas and a, supplementary, and a supplementary comment from a local scholar in the field. So, uh, I hope you note that in your events calendar and uh, we will see you again in the NLB. So tonight, it gives me great pressure, pleasure to introduce the chair of this evening. The chair of this evening is Professor Prasenjit Duara, uh, who is currently Raffles Professor of Humanities in the Faculty of Arts and Social Science. And concurrently, because in anyways you don't just get one job. <laughs> You usually get a couple, sometimes three for one salary. Uh, he is also concurrently the Director of Research in Humanities and Social Sciences in the Office of the Deputy President of Research, Professor Ryan. Thank you very much, Professor Benghua, and uh, welcome everybody. It is uh, my sheer pleasure to, uh, it, to be able to chair this evening's session uh, because, of course, uh, you all know, and uh, especially in this city, Professor Wang Kang Wu uh, needs absolutely no introduction. And in case he does need it for some chance person here, uh, you have the you have the details uh, that were circulated in the, uh, in the notice that you uh, saw. So I'm not going to spend uh, my time going over his many uh, publications, achievements, uh, honors, awards, uh, except to say that, that he is uh, uh, the university professor at National University of Singapore. And he's, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, well known, uh, not only, I think, in Asia, but perhaps to the world as the Doyle, the preeminent scholar of uh, China studies. And, uh, and uh, he is uh, certainly the Doyle in also in every sense of the word. He's also among the most senior and the most respected. And, uh, and which is why it is such a pleasure for me to introduce him here. Uh, the other thing about uh, Professor Wang that we all, of course, know is that he's also a public intellectual uh, with a face not only towards scholarship, but towards the public at large, and of course, towards uh, governments who uh, listen to him, uh, whether in China or in Southeast Asia. So. Uh, to talk a little bit about his work, which is uh, very extensive, it, uh, he starts out in the very early pre-modern uh, period of history, 
the Nahai trade, and then uh, moves on, of course, as you all know, mostly uh, in the area of the study of Chinese overseas, which he has done absolutely more than anyone else to shape. And um, in fact, I think that he has presented more than one paradigm for the understanding of uh, Chinese overseas and for why more widely the relationships between China and uh, these parts of Asia. And uh, I would say that one of, it, one of the rare things about a scholar that we find in uh, Professor Wang is that he has had an effect not just on shaping paradigms for uh, scholars and intellectuals, but for the identity of people as well. And I think that uh, there's been a lot of, you know, of course, discussion and debate about terminology and so on, but he has been the architect, the, or at least the central figure uh, shaping what it means, how one sees oneself. And um, this is very rare for us to find in a scholarly world, so it has been uh, very interesting for me to observe this particular role in uh, yeah. Now, of course, uh, Professor Wang is uh, well known everywhere uh, in all over Asia, and I should also say it's not just in Southeast Asia and China. Uh, he goes often to India, where I come from, despite my Southeast Asian allegiances, and um, he uh, uh, he is very well known there as well, and very well loved as well. And so we have here what we can probably call a genuinely Asian intellectual. Uh, now, I've probably said too much. Uh, this is, uh, let me also say a little bit, uh, this is getting a little <laughs> embarrassing probably for me. Uh, let me also say that I'm also very thrilled uh, to, uh, to be um, uh, chairing this session because of the topic. Uh, the idea of a century of uh, revolutions in China is actually, the way he has posed it in his little abstract. Uh, is in fact a very relevant, very interesting issue uh, because, you know, ever since the early 90s when the Chinese, uh, very prominent Chinese philosophers and activists, uh, uh, Li Zihou and uh, Liu Zaifu, uh, wrote, they wrote a very important tract. I think it was in the early 90s or maybe by 95 or something. It was called Kao Pei Kaoming, which is Farewell to the Revolution. And uh, it sort of it was, a, was, a, was a very important moment in how Chinese intellectuals uh, were beginning to think of what the role of revolution was. And since then, of course, there has been uh, a fair amount of debate back and forth, particularly with the so-called New Left School of Wang Wei who, uh, and others who <coughs> feel that uh, revolution is, continues, if not to be meaningful, at least the conditions that earlier called for it have not disappeared. So uh, let us, uh, so I'm very interested to hear Professor Wang's uh, views on this. Thank you. for your very kind words. I'm actually particularly delighted to be here this evening because uh, I have a very close association with the Asia Research Institute, Adi. Uh, like like uh, Professor Chua, we have been associated with it almost from the beginning, and it has been particularly exciting for us to see this institute grow so rapidly and has helped uh, the university develop a greater profile in Asian studies, something that uh, it certainly needed at the time Ali was uh, established. So for that, if no other reason, I'm particularly proud to be here this evening. The presenter has been very provocative in saying that the subject is so interesting to him. I, I was not sure that it was that interesting, but uh, I shall certainly try to convey my particular interest in the subject, which may or may not fit in with the concerns of uh, Wang Hui and uh, our dear friends in China. 
China has had several revolutions this past century, and we're about to celebrate the centenary of the first that led to the establishment of the Republic of China, the Republic of China, on January the 1st, 1912. A political revolution that promised to create a different kind of state. At the time, this republican state was something new, so that most Chinese people were not sure what their country was becoming. That revolution was followed by decades of civil war, exposure to foreign invasions, and in addition, by calls for further revolution. Why was, why was one revolution not enough and had to be followed by others? Did China need a revolution in the first place? Was the break with the country's political culture unavoidable? Most Chinese people are pragmatic. They accept that what has happened in this past, and there's little point in seeking answers to questions about events over which they had no control. Adopting the idea of revolution has made it possible for them to understand the drama of violent change that has happened to almost every country in the world. It has rendered revolutions everywhere more comprehensible and has drawn Chinese history closer to world history. That is now apparent, and I shall not, not dwell on that here. But the revolutions in China this past century raise questions about where they stand in Chinese history itself. How do they connect with the millennia of development that have made China what it is? This evening I shall try to show that the 1911 revolution was ultimately comparable to replacing an old mandate with a new one, and thus not such a break with the Chinese past as it might appear. One reason for this was, that was the adoption of the ancient Chinese word Germing for the 1911 revolution, as it is called, the Xinhai Geming, Geming of 1911. That revolution ensured that the word Geming would become the word to translate the modern idea of revolution. The idea of revolution itself has evolved, and volumes have been written to try to capture what precisely it means. Here, I should merely say that Revolution stands for transformative change, often achieved through violent action, with the violence being less relevant in recent usages. In comparison, the concept of Germing, also tied to the use of violence, has been central to political change throughout, Chinese, throughout recorded Chinese history. It is an ancient term that was used at least 2,500 years ago to describe the founder of the Shang Dynasty when he overthrew the last ruler of the Xia Dynasty, the so-called Xia Dynasty. The Ge in Geming means to change, and the Ming refers to Tianming, the mandate of heaven, to change the mandate, is what it means. Ever since then, Confucian scholars used that word to describe each dynastic change when one set of rulers took over from another. The Japanese understood that and chose in the late 19th century to use Germing or Gakume to translate the word revolution in the European textbooks that they introduced to their readers in Japan. And thus Germing began to acquire a wider meaning that included all kinds of transform transformative changes over and above the changes of dynastic houses. By accepting that Germing was appropriate, was the appropriate word to convey all the meanings of the word revolution, the Chinese thus opened their minds to other movements that challenged their traditional society. And they set out systematically, systematically to use Germing to rewrite all of their history and thus enable this ancient word to connect the dramatic events of the 20th century seamlessly, or almost seamlessly, to the whole of their past. 
My talk will focus on how this convergence of coming with revolution puts modern revolutions in a Chinese historical perspective. In order to examine the phenomenon and to avoid confusion, I shall distinguish the two concepts by employing Gurming when referring to Chinese history before 1900 and revolution, the English word, for events after that. Whenever I use the words together, I shall make clear where Gurming is used in its traditional sense and when it is used to be equated with revolution. In 1900, the Chinese revolutionary, a Chinese revolutionary arrived in Singapore. He was a young Cantonese called Sun Wen, better known as Sun Yat-sen. He was a graduate uh, in, 1987, in 1887 of the new Chinese Medical College in Hong Kong, who gave up his calling to become someone who has been identified now as the first professional Chinese revolutionary. But this term was not one he used for himself. It was applied to him by the Japanese when in 1896, after surviving his kidnapping uh, by the Qing Embassy in London, he arrived in Japan. The Japanese press referred to him as a Gakume Sha, a Gaminja, a revolutionary. But when he came to the Nanyang, four years later, he was a fugitive from the Qing government with the price on his head. In the Qing court's view, he was a rebel against divinely constituted order and had to be punished. He was no longer welcome in Hong Kong, where the British were under pressure from the Qing regime to arrest him on arrival. In Singapore, he could seek protection from colonial authorities that were not so afraid of the local Qing consular general's office. By that time, Sun Yat-sen had accepted the term Gaming Jaha because he saw that the name described what he was doing. He was out to overthrow the ruling dynasty and he saw this act, his act of rebellion as having right on his side and therefore worthy of the heavenly mandate. He was acting to save China by getting rid of rulers who were corrupt and incompetent, no longer capable of protecting the country. But he was exceptional in many ways. He was educated in foreign schools, both in Hawaii and Hong Kong. He had been around the world and featured in international headlines in London. He was influenced by European and American ideas about modern governance, governance not least the concept of nationalism and the nature of republican rule. Never before had a Chinese commoner sought to organize a worldwide movement to seize the mandate from outside the territories of China. Thus he could also compare himself with the leaders of revolution in Europe and America. He had studied their revolutions. They all began with rebellions and war. He was aware that outside help had sometimes been decisive in revolutionary victory, as in the case of the American Revolution, for example. <coughs> Sun Yat-sen's own beginnings as a rebel were linked with illegal societies and external funding. And he spent the rest of his political life seeking financial support from both inside and outside China. He also found it invaluable to remind his Chinese supporters that the Manchu house that conquered the Chinese Ming dynasty was foreign in origin. He would have been aware that Qing mandarins equated the Manchu victory of the Ming with Geming, the traditional sense of Geming, <coughs> having won a new mandate in 1644. But to him, this dynastic shift itself was not a revolution. Nevertheless, in so far as that mandate had run its course, the new Gaming was necessary. <coughs> and this he equated, in his own mind anyway, with revolution as he understood it. Sun Yat-sen <coughs> also received support from Chinese outside the country who wanted to see Chinese rule restored in China. And from his overseas background, he also drew on a tradition of secret society brotherhood that made the 
ideal, the Republican ideal, at least conceptually acceptable to his followers. Anyway, then to the amazement of most observers of the time, the Manchu rulers did give up power. And in January 1912, Sun Yat-sen became the acting president of the First Republic of China in Chinese history, First Republic in Chinese history. The revolutionary forces that he led did not have the strength to get any further than that. Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party was pushed aside, and he did not live to see the party, his party's army, get rid of the country's warlord regimes. On his deathbed in 1925, he had left the message that the revolution was not completed and exhorted his comrades to continue the struggle. Famous saying, Geming Changwei Changgong, Tongzhi Yuan Xu Li. Now what did, he mean? what did he mean by Geming here? Obviously the fact that the Manchus were removed and the Republic had survived at least two attempts to restore the monarchy was not enough. The Republic's president, Yuan Shikai, had himself initiated a restoration. And after he failed, another military man, Zhang Xun, made another attempt that also failed, and failed even more miserably. Sun Yat-sen knew in 1925 that his party had simply not finished the job, because it only controlled a couple of provinces, and even those rather precariously. The party was far from gaining the total victory that the effort to gain the mandate of heaven would require. From the way the Kuomintang continued thereafter to recite Sun Yat-sen's parting message even after the victory of 1928 and the international recognition of the Nanjing government, it suggests that the party leaders already believed that their revolution meant more than merely replacing an unworthy regime. It had to offer something more than that. They understood Sun Yat-sen's commitment to the national revolution, for example. Now, for such a revolution to be complete, the country would have to fulfill through his three goals of achieving national unity, giving people their rights, and assuring them of their economic well-being, as outlined in his three principles of the people, the Samin Pui. His young generation of followers could not agree with him more on this. But more interesting, their rivals who led the Kung Tandang, the CCP, also could not agree more, as they fought their civil war against the Kuomintang off and on for the next 20 years, often in the name of the uncompleted revolution. For most of them, the revolution was not completed until the CCP victory in 1949. In short, the 1911 revolution was only the beginning. The Republic proclaimed in 1912 was a mere preliminary change, a change in name, while decades of fighting had to be done before the job was finished, was complete. The Kuomintang claimed a partial victory in 1928 that was almost immediately hemmed in, almost wholly negated by the Japanese invasion of China, in 19, uh, of China. In the end, hope for victory was snatched away from them by the CCP, whose claim of revolutionary victory was confirmed by having the Kuomintang armies driven off the mainland in 1949. But Mao Zedong was not satisfied by that success which is more like the traditional sense of a mere change of dynastic house. To him, to Mao Zedong, 1949 itself was only just the first step in a much longer process whereby each victory was only one more step towards the next and many more steps had to be taken before the communist dream could be fulfilled. For the Kuomintang, revolution concentrated on gaining full sovereignty for the country with complete unification of all Chinese lands inherited from the Qing. For the CCP leaders, they appealed to a revolutionary ideology that was externally inspired. They expected to achieve, to achieve both stages of the French and the Russian revolutions in one goal, 
The final goal was to replace the existing classes of hereditary rulers by leaders who fought in the name of workers and peasants, people who were willing to make sacrifices for the sake of a future communist society. Now, these two interpretations of revolution overwhelmed all others in the two decades between the establishment of the nationalist government in Nanjing in 1928 and its fall in 1949. In fact, after forming the <coughs> national government and leading the war against Japan, the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, was no longer concerned with any other notion of revolution except that of regaining sovereignty over all Chinese lands. During that war, the party stood only for new heights of patriotic zeal and nation saving. <coughs> it was left to the Communist Party to speak of a transformative social revolution, something that would engage the poorer classes to help overthrow the existing order within China. One thing, however, was common to both parties. To a greater or lesser degree, both of them needed external help. The nationalists from the United States and its allies, and the communists from the Soviet Union and its allies. The victory of the CCP within four years after the end of the Second World War, between 1945 and 1949, surprised most people. Few had realized the extent of demoralization of the nationalist armies, and even fewer understood the appeal of the communist message for those who had endured years of hardship and were disillusioned by the incompetence of the nationalist leaders. On October the 1st, 1949, when the new forces of revolution were victorious, that victory was still nothing more than a power transfer through victory on the battlefield. Close, in fact, close to the original meaning of the word Gami. Here, Every Chinese understood the issue perfectly. The mandate had been given to the CCP, and it was now up to the CCP to ensure that this legitimacy was deserved and enduring, and the work of building the righteous order, the righteous new order, could finally begin. There were now two choices for the victors. One was to follow this tradition, and concentrate on stabilizing that order with a new set of rulers. The other was to pursue the ambitious and long-term goals laid down by the ideology that the CCP had copied from the Soviet Revolution. The CCP was far from united about what revolution really meant. As Mao Zedong soon began to complain, large numbers of his party members obviously preferred to simply consolidate and settle down, redesign the system, and enjoy the fruits of victory. It was also clear that what they inherited from the previous regimes was deeply rooted. Even after the violent and brutal campaigns to rid the countryside of landlords and cities of other exploitative classes, the machinery of government that the stakeholders of the bureaucracy were still entrenched, and all habits of rule had survived. And not least, the better educated patriots, of Chinese patriots, who had sympathized with the CCP during and after the war, had expectations of national development that contradicted those of Mao Zedong and his ideologues. The work of reconstruction did begin there was rapid industrialization. The economy was rescued from the pathetic conditions left by the Kuomintang. And efforts were made to affirm China's sovereign rights over territories that they would be needed to secure its survival. So very few people could understand why Mao Zedong seemed to be still echoing Sun Yat-sen's message. Gomin, Shang Wei Chen Gong the revolution was still incomplete and wanted continuous revolution to displace all features of tradi traditional society for the sake of a millennium, millennium <coughs> future. Something extraordinary had happened. In the person of Mao Zedong was a coming together 
of the Chinese tradition of coming and the modern ideology of revolution that was imported from outside. The tradition had stipulated that whoever won on the battlefield was the righteous ruler. While the textbooks of modern revolution were used to support Mao Zedong in his push to eliminate all vestiges of the past that he thought was obsolete and he thought stood in the, pro in the way of progress. For the next three decades, he tried to turn the party into his personal court, a sort of congregation that waited on his every word. At the same time, he wanted the party to act as a vanguard of an army for continuous revolution. He was extraordinarily successful in getting young followers to destroy as much as they could against the danger of the party's disintegration, the party itself disintegrating, it took someone like Deng Xiaoping to unscramble the conditions that Mao Zedong had created. Deng Xiaoping led the way to put an end to all talk of revolution and switch attention to reform, especially economic reform. It was left to him to say that the revolution was complete. The country could now focus on the task of guaranteeing national security and wealth. He brought closure and at least for a while ended the tension between continuity and the total break of the past that his Maoist colleagues had called for. Now let me sum up what the four leaders who called themselves revolutionaries stood for. Sun Yat-sen was the first, first in China, to equate the two words, Kermin and revolution. But his final message was filled with ambiguity. When he said that revolution was still incomplete, was he referring to the fact that his party was not yet in power and that China was still not united? Or was he concerned that China was not yet a nation, a nation that he so much wanted to build? Or was he thinking like French and Russian revolutionaries that the social order had not been transformed. From what we have of his writings, it does not seem clear what his priorities really were. His successors in the Kuomintang were divided about the party's goal, and the internal conflicts among them <coughs> dogged the party for the next two decades. Chiang Kai-shek, the military man who took over actual control of the government after 1928, I think he thought of himself as a revolutionary too, was burdened with civil war against the CCP and also the remaining warlords. And after 1937, had the task of saving China from Japanese conquest. Kerming was certainly incomplete if China was to be broken up, and was certainly, the Kerming was certainly not applied at all if China did not survive as a sovereign state. So given the circumstances, if Chiang Kai-shek could actually win a total victory on the battlefield, he would have succeeded beyond his dreams. What other revolution would he want if he could achieve just that? As for Matadong, his soaring ambitions were couched in more, much more complex terms. An extraordinary mixture of imperial glory, popular millenarianism, and European ideology that even his closest comrades could not fathom. But it was not his futurist vision that gained victory for the CCP. What was won on the battlefield was due to a traditional combination of daring strategies, external interventions, and the Kuomintang's mistakes. Not very different from what characterized the classic Kerming throughout Chinese history. Mao Zedong, of course, then went beyond that and asked the party to reach for his dreams and he was prepared to destroy the CCP if he did not follow his lead. The consequences were so dire that in the end it was left to Deng Xiaoping to come to the rescue. He was the committed revol revolutionary who came to reject Mao Zedong's supra-party and supranational goals and returned to the Basque party to what he considered to be the basics. By that he meant 
that a restored CCP should end all talk of revolution. The party should accept that their revolution had already succeeded, and all attention should be focused on, but uh, focused now on the wealth and power of a united nation. In essence, this completed revol revolution was reform to achieve goals not much different from those that Sun Yat-sen had 60 years earlier set up for himself. They were to create a, unite, a unified and sovereign nation with a popular support that marked heaven's approval, that was dedicated to becoming prosperous, strong, and secure. All this brings me back to the ancient word Gami. It is significant that this word could be aptly used to describe the rebellions that replaced the Qing dynasty, as well as the leaders sworn to fulfill their revolutionary ideals. The usage has been so successful that Chinese history has been rewritten, completely rewritten, to extend the idea of revolution backwards to apply to all aspects of dramatic, violent, or transformative change from ancient times to the present. <coughs> Historians have discarded the original meaning of Gurmin. Of they can decide now what events qualify as Gurmin in today's terms, that is, what events deserved to be called revolutions in the past. A striking example can be found in the writing of the history of the Qing dynasty. The last official history, the draft history of the Qing, was done in the 1920s. And that has been rejected as inferior and wrong, in part because of its adherence to Confucian terminology, Confucian rhetoric. The dynasty is seen now as one that was overthrown by a revolution, quite unlike the Manchu succession to the Ming in 1644. On the other hand, the failed but progressive Taiping rebels of the 19th century are described as modern Gurmin forces. That is, they are worthy to be called revolutionary, although they failed. Of course, rejecting the old draft Qing history is one thing. Agreeing on how to write a new history of the Qing is another, and we are now a hundred years later, a hundred years after the dynasty ended, we are now still awaiting the massive work that has been compiled, which actually begun, I think it will take many more years to be completed. One reason why Gurmin seemed so apt to describe the 1911 revolution is that the original meaning of Gurmin was never as narrow as it is assumed. In ancient history, the Shang rulers coming that displaced the Sha dynasty, which gets quoted again and again throughout all the times <coughs> history. That use of coming was not uh, not only described was not only the coming was not only described as righteous, but also represented as a success story that lasted for some 400 years. The Zhou coming that followed it, that removed the Shang house, lasted for. 700 years, over 700 years, and was considered even more successful. The Confucian historians were so impressed that they consistently used the word Gurmin whenever they described a change of dynastic houses thereafter. And through that usage, it mattered little how long the dynasty lasted or how much it achieved. Rather like uh, great inflation in universities today, Gurming became part of the rhetoric of legitimation. The founder of each dynasty expected to see that word used in his edicts and in the memorials that he and his successors received. The association with the Shang, Shang ruler's uh, righteous act of replacing the Shah dynasty was always up front in the, in, in, the, in the language used. All preparations of documents for the historical records also made sure that the term was always there. It would have been fatally treasonable if any official failed to use the word with every new dynasty, however brief or however incompetent it was. 
Thus, at its simplest, Gaming, as used in the Chinese histories, became a ritualistic or even technical term <coughs> that simply acknowledged a new <coughs> dynasty. In this way, the term acquired the meaning of being no more than a change of ruling house, with nothing else much changed, but under new management. There are two other reasons why this meaning has become dominant. One is a view held by many historians of China, both within and outside, that the Chinese imperial system essentially did not change for at least 2,000 years. It can certainly be argued that the Qin, Qin, Qin Shuangdi, the Qin unification 2,000 years ago, was a decisive break with the heritage of the earlier Zhou dynasty, which lasted from the 11th to the 3rd centuries BC. But the high, the high rhetoric of the Chinese classics and the mantras used thereafter in dynastic history encouraged misunderstanding. They had confused the continuity of certain basic ideas and institutions with an overall picture of stagnation and no change. And that's a, therefore the image of an unchanging China. And that image became so strong that it has, it has influenced the thinking of most Chinese as I shall show below, it is a profound misrepresent, misrepresentation of Chinese history that was used to fit the Confucian paradigm of order. The second source, the second reason for this unchanging China came from the West. Ever since the West first read the reports of the Jesuits about the late Ming and the early Qing, early Qing China, they were struck by the cultural stability that led them to conclude that there was no institutional change or intellectual excitement in China. This was probably justified of the conservative Ming dynasty on its last legs that was both backward looking and complacent. But it showed only a superficial understanding of the vigorous reforms introduced by the early Manchu emperors of the Qing dynasty. Nevertheless, 18th century European philosophers stress the unchanged features of China. And that image deeply influenced the writings of Hegel and Karl Marx. Eventually, the CCP itself, led by Mao Zedong, drew on Marxist Leninist theories to, con con to condemn all Chinese traditions and espouse the ideal that revolutions should be continuous until the revolution completed, ended, completely ended the rule of exploitative classes, the moment when humankind arrived at the communist stage of history. This second source from the West ended up with, the, with this idealist vision that has now been discarded, and I think, don't think need to detain us here. The first source perpetuated by official Confucian historians, is misleading and needs to be addressed. There were significant differences between the coming of each of the following dynasties, the Qin, the Han, the Tang, the Song, the Mongol, the Mongol Yuan, the Ming and the Qin, these are the major dynasties that did last a long while, except for the Qin. There were much greater differences between all of these and the scores of short-lived dynasties that claim new mandates in the official history. Scores of them. Some of the, but some of the long-lived dynasties did achieve transformations that could be compared to revolutions, if you look closely at them. And there's also evidence that some major transformations in Chinese history actually occurred during the in-between periods of instability when ambitious and enterprising groups from different classes of society sought to gain power within, both within and outside the formal structures. In short, beyond officialese, the, the bureaucratic language that was used, historical evidence does not support the view that Gurming had always been simply just a change of dynastic houses. It depends on which dynasties we're referring to and the conditions and scale of changes. Under the, for example, under the mandate of the Zhou Dynasty during the 12th, during the 11th century BC, 
a totally new feudal measures were introduced under his, feudal, his first rulers. The changes were continuous for centuries, with major innovations made to the nature and practice of governance down to the establishment of the first empire some 700 years later. That feudal system produced some of the most creative thinkers in Chinese history. In particular, the two centuries that followed the death of Confucius were times of great transformations. A wide range of new ideas was debated during what has been called the world's axial age. During over 700 years of the Zhou Dynasty, some of the most fruitful changes in governance, in methods of production, had taken place. Indeed, it was during this period that the Confucian idea of Gurming was developed, developed by Mencius and his followers, and was used quite appropriately for the first empire when the Qin state conquered the six other warring states. This is the third century BC. The new mandate for the Qin Empire really opened China up to changes that few today would doubt were revolutionary. But it is important to realize that those changes came as a climax to several centuries of original experiments and fresh thinking during a, a period that was not associated with coming as dynastic change at all. The Qin Empire lasted only less than 30 years and was overthrown by a popular rebellion against all the hereditary families of the warring states. With only the second Gurmi in some 800 years, the Han Dynasty, only the second after 1400 after years, the Han successor empire to the Qin was much more successful. Their rulers rejected the most extreme of the Qin measures, introduced tolerant and caring policies, that gave the people the chance to rebuild the economy. Within decades, the empire was flush with wealth and the fourth Han Emperor, Han Wudi, could reach out across the empire's borders and expanded the empire to its greatest extent. He also, he was also the person who gave Confucian scholars the chance to make their ideas the new orthodoxy of his empire. And that was responsible for the thousands of books written to explain how the centuries of consolidation in the second and first century BC shaped the nature of the Chinese monarchical system. And this has contributed to this image of unchanging China, an image that has remained so strong largely because of the resilience of Confucianism through the centuries. But that image does not stand closer scrutiny. The decline and fall of the Han, the indecisive wars of the famous Three Kingdom period, the weakness of the Jin dynasty in the third century AD, each experiencing short dynastic changes, was a very volatile period. It was followed by challenges, for example, from massive foreign invasions, one after the other, from indigenous, indigenous Taoist-inspired revolts against the regimes, and from the freshness of newly imported ideas of Buddhism from India. And even greater changes took place during this period. There were more dynastic coming during that time, altogether some 20 ruling houses between the 4th and 7th centuries. Now, none of these dynasties can be labeled as revolutionary in any sense. Certainly none of them had enough time or the will to chalk up enduring changes that could be compared to the achievements of the Qin and Han dynasties. And it was not until the Sui dynasty united the empire, reunited the empire in the year 589, that dramatic change was once again officially recorded. Certainly none could match the transformations during the Tang dynasty that succeeded in the Sui dynasty in 618, Changes that enabled a civilization grandeur that stamped the Tang Dynasty as one of the greatest eras in Chinese history. In fact, the achievements of the Tang owed a great deal to those short-lived predecessors 
that each were, were each too brief to make claims to significant changes themselves. During the three centuries of division, the Chinese mind was open to Buddhism and parallel changes in Taoist thought. State and society during, during this period were in great ferment almost throughout those three centuries. The demographic melting pot of dozens of tribal peoples who moved into China, especially to North China, was also stirred by many experiments with fresh ideas. The previously dominant Confucians struggled to survive during this period and managed to do so by taking on new ideas in order to advance their own course. What came out of all this was, when China was again united, new rulers could bring all the strands of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism together to redefine the contours of new cultural values for the Chinese people. Changes during the Tang, of course, were also important. And the changes in the recruitment process, for example, the recruitment through examinations, did bring about new elites that challenged the aristocratic govern, govern, governance. And this opened the society to even new, to a, to a new class of mandarins, and that was important. And with the Tang cities open to foreign commerce, foreign missions, and missionaries from the West, both overland and by sea, the conditions were ready for an enriched civilization that the Tang dynasty saw. The key to Tang success was total victory, unification, and the necessary peace for the economy to flourish. It is, however, of, it is however often forgotten how brief that period was, only about 150 years. In the, to the middle of the Tang Dynasty. From the second half of the 8th century onwards, rebellions within the empire, invasions from outside, and military rivals among the Tang army's officers themselves, brought about the eventual demise of the powerful elites and brought about the breakup of the empire once again. All, only 150 years after, the Tang had been established. Interestingly, it was also during this period that further great changes took place in Chinese society that led to the intellectual and bureaucratic reforms of the following Song Dynasty. In short, revolutionary change need not depend on dynastic change. A successful coming by a strong and long-lived dynasty could focus on consolidating cha changes that had already occurred, or it could choose to initiate further major changes on its own. The past thousand years of Chinese history since the Song Dynasty show that this was so. For example, the Song, the Song Dynasty, the Gurming that it represented was only partial. The China that it inherited from the Tang had to be shared with northern tribal groups then the Kitan, the Jurchen, the Tangut, and then with the Mongol, who finally destroyed the Song dynasty altogether. Because the Gurming was incomplete, the Song became politically defensive, but it succeeded, however, in encouraging creativity in the administrative, economic, social, and cultural realms. So even when militarily weak, the dynasty saw great civilizational advances. When the Mongol, the Yuan Dynasty, took total control in 1278, their ideas about their world-conquering destiny were aggressive and most destabilizing. But they, nevertheless, fundamentally changed the military and political system in China, something akin to the results of violent revolution. Although it was brief, less than 100 years, its impact on the successor Chinese Ming Dynasty was great. It led the founder of the Ming Dynasty to concentrate on restoring the great institutions of the Han and the Tang, at least in name, as iconic symbols of Gurming that could help the Ming fulfill its mandate. 
And while appealing to the past, he actually made many radical changes to what he inherited from the UN governing structure. In today's terms, this could be seen as perhaps reactionary rather than revolutionary. And the best that he can be said of the changes is that his coming was a violent overthrow of a previous regime and almost everything that the Mongol Yuan stood for. It represented a fresh start that drew on past resources. He offered a sense, a very strong sense, of continuity with the past. But the China that he left behind was far from unchanged. He had, in fact, taken many steps to undo what he inherited from the Mongols. Similarly, although in an opposite direction, the Manchu government, the new mandate that it had, called for the retention of many main ideas and institutions, at least on paper, and encouraged the Chinese people that they ruled to stay loyal to their values. But in fact, the Qing rulers totally restructured the nature of imperial governance around Manchu elites while ensuring that well-rewarded Confucian mandarins that were selected in the most traditional ways were allowed to assist them in their monopoly of power. Most decisively, they reconceived the idea of empire in quite different terms and extended their efforts to bring all the tribal groups beyond the traditional borders of China into their fold. In doing so, they used very original methods of incorporation that were to have a lasting impact on China today. This Manchu Qing Gurmi, this new mandate of theirs, was not at all a mere change of dynastic house. It laid the foundations of a new national framework that Sun Yat-sen and his successors this past century have strenuously tried to preserve. It can be argued that the innovations of the Qing Empire have determined some of the most important goals of unification and nation building that the 20th century of revolutions had to deal with. Earlier I asked three questions about the 20th century. Why was one revolution not enough and had to be followed by others? This is a matter of definition. In perspective, what happened can be interpreted as different stages of one revolution that remained incomplete until the end of the century. Did China need a revolution in the first place? Is my second question. By the end of the 19th century, it was in the Chinese tradition to think that Gurming as a change in the failed Qing mandate was not necessary. To call it a revolution did not alter that need for change. My third question was, was the break with the country's political culture unavoidable? The attempt to cut clear of that culture by Mao Zedong failed. The goals of the revolution are no longer all that different from what a traditional Gurmin would have sought. Historians agree that the 20th century revolution became deeper and fuller after the Chinese Communist Party came to power in 1949. Some would argue that success and completion only came after Deng Xiaoping had turned communism on its head. It was he who created the conditions for the transformations that has made China into the second largest economy in the world, now on the threshold of becoming a great power of the 21st century. During the past century, the word Gurmin, to stand for revolution, has been extended to so many other processes that the connection with its traditional roots is now remote. But as I have shown above, once you get rid of the slogans about continuous revolution, it was extremes, once you get rid of the extremes, and you get rid of the ritual, the ritualistic mantra of dynastic accession, the traditional idea of Gurmin as mandate for unity, power, power, and prosperity 
compares very well with the goals of revolution during the past century. Today, Kerming could additionally refer to long-term changes like the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and a host of other changes ranging from general social and economic uh, revolutions to almost anything that has gone through transformative change. But the dynamics of such changes may, of course, from time to time, need to be accompanied by drastic and violent acts. But that, too, is consistent with Chinese political tradition. The Chinese acknowledge that there are and have been many kinds of coming in their history that can be equated with revolutions. Although nominally accompanied by dynastic shifts, the concept has always carried expectations of being on the right side, the right side of history, but right? so the right side of the, of the moral power, the authority that conferred legitimacy on anyone. Gurming was, in other words, not limited to the transfer of power or mere regime change. Its association with the new mandate to rule assumed the duty to produce changes that were necessary for the mandate to be properly fulfilled. Thus, like the word revolution, the Gurmin concept was a complex one. No Gurmin was ever complete if it did not meet the obligation to produce, to produce the achievements that were expected of it. Now, during the 20th century, it served similar aspirational purposes in 1911 and in 1949, but went out of control in 1966 under Mao Zedong. The fact that after 1978, the word is no longer needed, tells us that the legitimacy assumed to be conferred on the battlefield, to the victor on the battlefield, has been confirmed. The century of revolution is ending with both concepts of Gurming and revolution enriched and reinforced by association. Together, they are now combined and integrated into the new Chinese political culture. Thank you, and I uh, hope to see you at the next event. <laughs>